Eh bien, mon ami, euh, Monsieur Sherif, euh, Madame la Présidente, je ne sais pas en quelle langue dois-je parler, mais en tout cas, j'ai fait l'accord avec Monsieur Sherif que je vais parler en anglais pour être vraiment une université internationale. Ouais. Et, euh, well, what are the strong lines of the classical Arabic thought? Indeed, uh, we are now in front of a lot of misconceptions, misapprehensions, misrepresentations of the Arabic and Islamic thinking. For a simple reason that we and Europe, we are not living in the same historical moment. Europe is living in the 21st century. They have three major periods behind them. The classical period, the medieval period, and the modern period. Some Western philosophers would say that they are the end of the modern period, modernism, postmodernism, nihilism, etc. But we in the Arab world, we have only two cycles behind us. We are living in the 15th century. We have only the classical and the medieval, and we are still shooting for a modern time. Then between us and Europe, there are about 500, 600 years of decalage of time. That's why we are not speaking the same language. We are not thinking in the same manner. Uh, however, permit me to give you the major guidelines in the Islamic thinking in the classical one. We have invented three types of disciplines of thinking concerning the relation between scriptures and reason. We have created scriptural rational re uh, disciplines. That means sciences or disciplines combining scripture, that means revelation, with human reason. And then we have created also scriptural sciences, something similar to biblical criticism, in the West, and then we have created also mathematical and physical sciences depending only on reason and nature. And we are very proud of our uh, classical, mathematical, and physical sciences. But permit me just to give you what are the, ma the major scriptural, rational sciences which we have created in the past. We have created four disciplines, theology, philosophy, mysticism, and not jurisprudence, but methodology of jurisprudence. How to think the law. Concerning theology, well, all our theologians have defended what we call the transcendence of God. That means God is the absolutely transcendent he is invisible, he is not anthropomorphic, he is something au-delà, which cannot be represented, perceived by human senses or by human even reason. It is the absolutely beyond. But this unity reflects itself in human life. In the unity of the human being, without having any discrepancy between the internal side and the external side, between my deeds and my words, between what I believe and what I think, in order to prevent myself from falling in, into all types of double talk, double personality, hypocrisy. Then the unity of the human per person is a reflection on the unity of God. Secondly, the unity of society. In order not to have classes, discrepancy of classes, upper class and lower class. Thirdly, the unity of mankind. In order to have one humanity away from sectarianism, racialism, separation of peoples and cultures and so on then the unity of God is not an abstract one, but it reflects itself in all types of unities in human life, including the unity of the family, father, mother, and sons and daughters, and seeing the world all the time by this eye of unity. 
But this unity of God or transcendence of God manifests itself into justice. Justice is the implementation of the unity of God because the unity of God without justice has no meaning. And justice appears in the dependence of man on his reason and on his free will. Then justice has two manifestations, reason and freedom. And after life, man will be judged according to the law of worthiness, to the law of merit. Everyone will be judged according to his deeds, good deeds or bad deeds. All the previous prophets are a part of Islamic revelation since Abraham till Muhammad. All of them are carrying the same message of unity and justice and merit. And uh, I cannot be a Muslim without believing in all the previous prophets. That's why making dialogue with others is a part of human life, is a part of Islam. Islam is a genuine combination between Judaism and Christianity, between law and love, eye for eye, teeth for teeth. That's fine. But sometimes love and forgiveness are also good in human behavior. A Muslim is this man who has the choice to behave according to the law of Moses or according to love of Jesus. It is this free choice between the kingdom of law or the kingdom of love. That's why a Muslim is tolerant vis-a-vis -vis other religions. He is pluralistic by nature. He believes that there are many perspectives in truth and he is presenting only one. Then this is the core of what we call uh, theology in Islam. That means the creed. But mysticism comes to counterbalance this creed, this rational creed, which may appear sometimes abstract, to have another vision of the transcendence of God, beginning by the spiritual experience, that faith is a spiritual experience of unity with God. It is a spiritual exercise where man can, by his psychological states and steps, unify himself with God, beginning by love and ending by a certain kind of self-absorption in, in God, seeing also all religions, all mankind, all human beings from the eye of unity. If I come to the law, the philosophy of law, the methodology of law. Islamic law is something based on what we call fitra, that means something naivety, something innate. Islamic law is not an oppression to human nature. It is an exploration of human nature. Anything which human nature would affirm, Islamic law would affirm it. Anything which human nature does negate, Islam would negate it. For instance, if I behave, I can behave according to five levels of human behavior, what we call now in the modern logic, deontic logic. That means the logic of duty. duty. Behave as if I am under an absolute law, a Kantian duty. Don't kill. Or behave according to a negative law also, respect others. Or I can behave according to, to something optional, which is more according to the positive aspect or something negative, more close to the negative aspect, mandub and makruh. Or I can behave according to my innocence, my primitive innocence in Islam, if everyone behave according 
to his primitive innocence, he would be a good Muslim, irrespective of his creed. Even if he does not believe in God, then he would be a human, a human, a human being. And Islamic law is based on five big intentions. Maqasid al-Sharia. Five big foundations. The respect of life, Anything against life would be against Islam. The respect of reason, because life manifests itself in reason, otherwise will be like animals. And then life expresses itself in reason and in a norm, otherwise will fall into certain kind of relativism, skepticism, as we see sometimes in, we in Western ethical systems, and fourthly, Islamic law is based on what we call honor, dignity, human rights, and finally, Islam is based on the respect of the public wealth, of the national wealth, of the natural resources, al-mal. Usually, people would think that Islam is, has a harsh law. They have in mind all the time the penal code, but the penal code is not essential in Islam. It is some, something which comes after having man's rights. I can have my rights in dwelling, in working, in earning, against unemployment, against uh, disease, and if I commit a mistake, I can be punished. But all the poor, all the unemployment, all those who are deprived in human life, all those who are marginalized, then they have their excuses according, and, and according to their behavior. Also, people would think that jihad in Islam, that means what we call the holy war, is something offensive. No, jihad in Islam, it is, it is a pure defensive aspect. If you are attacked, if you are kicked out of your homes, if you are threatened, then you can defend yourself according to the international law. But you will never begin by attacking anybody because if you attack somebody, you are going to violate the principles of Islam, which is life and so on. Islam would give the absolute freedom of belief for everybody. No one had the right to ask somebody to believe as I believe because we can never unify human beliefs. And finally, in philosophy, the philosophers, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Abi Rais, they have said that revelation is equal to reason, is equal to nature. Revelation and reason are the same. It is not like Thomas Aquinas or the Christian theology where I may have a natural reason who can think and can arrive that there is deity, but in order to know that God is Jesus Christ, here I need faith. I don't know this by the natural reason. In Islam, natural reason can arrive to the transcendence of God, to the justice, and to the merit, and uh, reason is equal to faith. And the reason is equal to nature. When I think in nature, I can know the laws of nature. There is no exceptions in the laws of nature. There are certain determinism in nature. That's why I can create sciences and so on. Philosophers invented logic, invented metaphysics, invented physics, and they have respected all the neighboring cultures the Greco-Roman from the West, and the Persian Indian from the East. They call Socrates the wisest of all men, not Muhammad, Socrates. They called Plato the man of light and power. They called Aristotle the first master, and Al-Farabi the second master. See how modest they were. They called the Ptolemy the first Ptolemy, but Al-Hazan, who is a mathematician, the second Ptolemy. That's to tell you how Muslims would respect the cultures of others, although they were not Muslims, 
the Greeks and the Romans. However, they gave them their rights and their due. And uh, they invented a virtuous city where man can live happily. There is the king philosopher at the top of the city and everyone is enjoying his virtues like Plato Republic. And finally, concerning biblical criticism, the Muslims created how to guarantee the revelation in history to be authentic. Renan is saying in the beginning of the life of Jesus, I have learned biblical criticism from the Muslim because Renan was an orientalist and a philosopher and a biblical criticist in the same time. Then the Muslims put all the laws of narratives, how to guarantee that narratives are true in history. But as I said in the beginning, we are living now in a moment to end our Middle Ages, to shoot for our modern times. Since 200 years, we are trying movements of reformation, of modernism, of renaissance, and so on, to end this second 700 years and begin our modern times. But we are hit sometimes by colonialism, by underdevelopment, by dictatorship and hegemony, by sectarianism, but these are accidental realities. These are not the essence of Islam. This is the type of historical phase which we are passing. We are trying to fight this in order that we can return again to the strong lines of thinking in Islam and to begin our modern times in the next 700 years. Thank you very much.